but it is good to be here this morning. And it, it seems like, and as I mentioned earlier, it seems like every sermon, it seems like every class, it seems like every time people talk today uh, in this day and age, that all we can talk about is how odd this year has been. You go, on, you go on to Facebook and, and, and you won't scroll past one page that somebody's not commenting on 2020 being a rough year. Uh, and it has been. It has been a, a, a strange year. It's been something that has been odd. It's been something that's different than we've ever experienced in the world. Uh, now, like I said before, there's been, there's been other pandemics but you got to remember, the last time we had a major pandemic, we didn't have people who were together as much as we are today. We, you didn't have people who went to the, You had more people that lived on farms. You had more people who lived out, of, uh, out, of the, out in the rural areas. You, you had people who were automatically separated. So this year has been just so much different than anything before and for that reason every conversation every sermon every lesson it takes on a little bit different meaning it takes on a little bit different aspect and we look at things a whole lot different and uh, we have um, it, it seems to be getting worse you know it, we started out there and and, and in March they started shutting everything down. They started uh, telling people to shelter in place. They tell people to, to not go out. They told people to, uh, they shut down all the restaurants. They shut, I mean, therefore, uh, you couldn't go into a restaurant anywhere. Everybody was just takeout only. Uh, you had... Um, you had Walmart. You had a guy standing out there in front of Walmart with an iPad counting the people that went in and counting the people that came out. I went to Walmart Friday. Parking lot was full and it was wide open. And our numbers are going up. Our numbers are still climbing. We had our record day uh, this past week. We had more new cases in Tennessee than any other day that there was, but yet... Things are still opening back up. And it gets me to the idea that we, uh, and, and what I see in this is people are tired of it. Uh, and, and, and a lot of people have gotten to the atti attitude, and, and whether it's right or whether it's wrong, but a lot of people have gotten to the attitude that if I get it, I get it. I'm just, I, I can't take this anymore. And, and that's where a lot of people are today, and they, they've reached a breaking point. And they have, uh, they've just decided we're going we're gonna to go on. And the thing is, is as a church, I feel like we need to be at that breaking point to where, not to where we say we don't care about coronavirus, but where we say we've got to have faith in God and we've got to minister. We as a church, and we've, we've, I, I see churches today, and, 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 and me and John Dave were talking earlier, uh, I, I know of churches that this week have decided to shut back down and go back to online only. I know of churches that are going back to parking lot only. And I'm not saying we're beyond doing that again. I'm not saying we're not going to do that again. You know, we may, if, if things change, we may go back to that. But we're not going to stop ministering. We're not going to, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't ever want us to stop our single mom's ministry. If we have to bring in single moms uh, next month and put one in that corner and one in that corner and one in this corner, we've got to continue to minister. We've got to continue as a church to move forward. We've got to continue because here's the thing. We as a church are called to missions. And that for that reason, I'm going to start a new series today on missions. I'm going to talk about missions in the scripture. Now, 
When you talk about missions, I, I think it's funny. One of the classes that I had to take in seminary was, uh, was, was on missions. It was, it was basically, um, I forget the name of the, of the class. It was Global Studies. That's what it was. It was Global Studies. And we studied missions. And we studied the history of missions. And we studied what missions have worked and what missions throughout history have, have done and how, they were, how we've reached out to people all over the world. And, and we talked about the difference in being in a mission and missions. A lot of people don't realize that there's a huge difference between a mission and missions. You go to uh, you go to De or to Webster's Dictionary or Dictionary.com, and or you do a Google search for a definition of missions. And you know what they do? They give you the plural. They tell you it's the plural of a mission, but that's not the way we look at it. When you look at a mission. Uh, in military, we have missions. You have a mission. Uh, businesses, we have a mission. We have a mission statement, which tells what we want to do, where we want to go, how we're going to do things. It tells what our goals are in, as, a, as, a, as, a, um, as an organization. It tells what we want to do. A mission is also, I'll give you the, just a few of the highlights of the definitions that I found. An important assignment carried out for political, religious, or commercial purposes, typically involving travel. An organization or an institution involved in a long-term assignment in a foreign country. Or a strongly felt aim, ambition, or calling. Those are three of the top definitions that I found for a mission. None of those have to do with what we consider or what we look at in this world or in, in Christianity as missions. When I think of missions, it's not just a plural form of a mission. When we talk about missions, there's something that we call a mission theology or the, the, the study or the, the, the way that we go about in a religious organization of reaching out to the world. It's a way of us taking the Word of God outside of this building is what missions is. Now, growing up in a Baptist church, when we talked about missions and when we heard about missions, I thought of the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. I thought of Lottie Moon Christmas offering. You know, I thought of those things. I thought of the International Mission Board, or and I thought of the Home Mission Board, or the the uh, American Mission Board. I, I thought of those things, and I thought about missionaries. I remember when we were in in uh, Bible school studying about missionaries, and I remember I remember one time we had a. Um, we had a guy who was a missionary to America who was from Jamaica. Now imagine that. We have people from Jamaica. Now this was back when I was a little boy. We had people from Jamaica who were coming to America to be missionaries. And it's not changed. I remember him because he taught us some songs. And when I hear those songs today, I, I, I still sing them with, in my mind, I still sing them with his accent and the way that he, uh, I, I remember, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. But the way he sung it, it was just, uh, it was something different. He taught me that song and I can't sing it any other way today than the way that that Jamaican sung it. But... I remember those things, and I remember learning and talking about missionaries. And I think that we as, as Baptists, as Southern Baptists, through the cooperative program, the, the, the International Mission Board, the North American Mission Board, we, we have a good reputation of taking those missions throughout the world. But we as the church, and as the people of the church, Sometimes we have become complacent and we consider missions as a missionary's job. 
We consider, you know, as long as I give my money to the church and the church gives its money to the, to the cooperative program, then I've done my job in missions. But folks, I want you to know that we have not done our job in missions, and we still struggle with that, and we have a lot more to do. It is not my job to do missions. It's not the missionary's job to do missions. It's everybody's job to do missions. And we have to take those missions to the world around us, and that is what it means. Taking the Word of God to those who don't have it. It don't have to be on the other side of the world. It don't have to be on the other side of town. It can be across the street. It can be, which is just as an important mission as sending somebody to Africa. is sending somebody across the street. And we have failed periodically in our world and in the church at that. Before coronavirus happened, we saw declines in churches. Didn't, not just in the Baptist churches, we saw it in all the churches. We saw declines in churches all over the place. And now that coronavirus has happened, it's, it's continuing. And it's becoming harder and harder for the churches. And, and, and now, the only thing we've got to go off of is how many views we get on Facebook. And, and, and things like that is what a lot of them are going off of. And... Listen, we're struggling. We're struggling as a church. And I'm not talking about just here at Greenwood. I'm talking about the church as a whole is struggling to get the word out. And the reason is is because people have become complacent and quit being mission-minded. And that's what we got to get back to. So I'm going to start talking today about missions in the Bible. And we're going to start with the Old Testament. Now, I know that a lot of people, uh, I remember when we started with the Old Testament and started first talking about the Old Testament and missions in the Old Testament, people thought, you know, the church didn't start till the New Testament. Where is missions in the Old Testament? Well, we're going to start today talking about that. God has always been a missional God. He's always been missionally driven. And it started back with Abraham. With what did he tell Abraham? He said, "Through you I will bless all nations." That right there tells me that God had a goal and a plan from day 1 with Abraham to reach out to other nations, to reach out to other peoples, to let other peoples know about God through Abraham and through his lineage, which became the Jews. Um, he did not... God chose the Jewish people. He chose the children of Israel to be his people. But he did not say they are the only ones. He said that all nations need to be blessed through them. So... He used the Israelites. He used the Jews to reach those other people. Started with the, the Gentiles who were within their borders. And then they drew people in. Now, we're going to start talking today. The first way that we're going to look at missions is through the temple. The temple is one of the ways that God drew people from the whole region. Now, we're going to start out with the opening of the temple today. We're going to start out with, with when God opened the temple. And we will be in 1 Kings chapter 8 as we look at, at God, His plan for the temple. You see, the, the temple started out as a tabernacle. It started out as they left the, the, uh, the land of Egypt. They, they went through and wandered through the desert. And God gave them a tabernacle which was hit, known as His dwelling place. It was known as the place where He resided. It was known as the place where they came to worship. It was known as the place that they came to make their sacrifice. And that became their place. But then when we see after many years... 
in the land of Canaan that God allowed Solomon to build a temple. He allowed Solomon to build this temple so that they could replace the tabernacle and God could have this permanent place in Israel to where all the people of Israel could turn and look to God. And this was initially set up, and every, a lot of people thought that this was set up as only a place for the Israelites. And there are still Jews today, there are still Israelites today that believe that it's just for them. They still believe that they're the only ones that, that, are, that it's for. But here's the thing. God established this temple and set it up so that everybody could see it. He set it up so that everybody, all the foreigners who passed through, all the people who came into the land could see. Listen, Israel had a reputation at this point. Israel already had a reputation. As they came out of the land of Egypt, Moab, they feared them because of the blessings of God. Here in 1 Kings chapter 8, we see that they start to open the temple. They, we see that they, are, they, are, they, are, they have brought the Ark of the Covenant up to the temple. We see that they are, they are preparing to offer the sacrifices at the temple. We see the people of, of Israel gathered around, and Solomon starts to pray. And he starts to lift up the children of Israel to God in this prayer. And he starts to say, God, as, as, I've, as we open this temple, I want this to be a place that your people, as they, as they falter, can look back to. I want this to be a place that your people can look to as they go to battle. I want this to be a place that your people can come back to. But then we get down to, we're going to start with verse 41. It says, moreover concerning a foreigner who is not your people Israel but has come from a far country for your name's sake for they will hear of your great name and your strong hand and your outstretched arm when he comes and prays toward this temple here in heaven your dwelling place and do according to all for which the foreigner calls to you that all people of the earth may know your name and fear you as do your people Israel and that they may know that the temple which I have built is called by your name. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your mission mindedness. Because, Lord, I, without it, none of us here today could know you. And I thank you, Lord, that you saw fit to draw people. I thank you, Lord, that you saw fit to draw me. In your name we pray. Amen. So we look at this. And Solomon makes it plain. He makes it clear that one of the purposes of this temple is so that the Gentiles and so that the foreigners in the land could look to this temple. They could look upon this temple and they could see the hand of God. Now, like I said before, the, the children of Israel had a reputation. People feared the hand of God. They feared the God of the Israelites. When they, remember when they left out, of, when they came, first came into to Canaan, as they were getting ready to cross the Jordan, the people of Jericho trembled because they knew that the Israelites were blessed. And they knew that the Israelites had God on their side. And they knew who God was. And they knew that. And for that reason, Rahab, we see right there that, that this was one example of somebody who knew the power of God because of the blessings of God upon his people. She turned to God. She followed after God. We, saw that she, she, we see that she gets to be in the line of Jesus because she knew the reputation of the children of Israel and their following God. Folks, as we look at this today, I want to, to, to look at the fact that people outside of the Jews, people, the Gentiles, the foreigners of the land, 
They could see what God was. They could see who God was. They could see what God could do simply because of the blessings on the children of Israel. Simply because of the way that the children of Israel turned to God. Simply because of the ways that the children of Israel followed God. Now I want you to think about something. At this particular time in Jewish history, this was probably the strongest that the Jews had ever been. They had just came out of, of following David. Now, we know that David failed at, at, at a lot of things. We know that David failed at some things. But we also know that David was still considered a man after God's own heart. And because of that, God blessed David greatly. God blessed David and he blessed all of Israel because of David. We see morality at a high point at that point. We see that at this point in Israel's history, David has died. Solomon has taken over. Solomon has not yet turned his heart away from God. This is still at the point when God has allowed him to build the temple. This is at the point that, that Solomon is closest to the God. This is right after the point where Solomon has asked for wisdom and God has blessed him greatly. This is the greatest moment in all of Israel's history. And Solomon realizes that and looks around and says, People see what you do. People see that what the children of Israel are doing. They see how you're reacting. They see that you're moral. They see that you're living for God. They see the blessings of God upon you. And because they're able to see that, and they're able to see God's strong hand upon the children of Israel, because of that, people will want to be a part of it. And because of the way that God is blessing the children of Israel, foreigners are going to want to come to his temple. Foreigners are going to turn and pray to his temple. Foreigners are going to come and look to God for strength because of the way you do. Wow. When I think of that, I think, are we, are we following after the ways of the temple? Are we as a church being the temple of today? Or is, is there anybody out there in this world who looks at the way we as Christians live? Are they looking at your life and are they saying, Wow, he is living for God because God is blessing him and I want to have what he has. You see, that's what Solomon is praying here. That people, the foreigners, the Gentiles are going to look to them and they're going to want what they have. Are people looking at your life and the way you live your Christian life and thinking, man, I want some of that? Unfortunately, in our world today, I don't know about you all, but if you, if you look on Facebook, some of my Christian friends on Facebook are some of the biggest whiners. <laughs> it really is. They, they, you know, and I, and I try not to... to, to Go to I, I very I rarely post anything other than our sermons on on Facebook, but you know sometimes I I've just got to get on there. Um, matter of fact, I've got a um, I, I've got somebody that uh, I know really well, and and listen this is this is somebody who is a youth pastor or filling the youth leader's role in one of our sister churches. And I, I rarely comment on people's because I, I, I don't want to get I don't want to get drug into arguments. I don't want to get you know I, I don't want to make I, I don't want to make us look bad as a church. I don't want to make Christians look bad. So I rarely get on there and comment on anybody else's opinions or anything like that. But just yesterday, he posted an article that was over two years old about a pastor who had failed and had, had, had went out on his wife of a large church, uh, got remarried, and, and continued to pastor. And listen, I'm not defending that man. And that's what I told him. I'm not defending what he's done. I'm not defending anything about it. But I want you to think about your post. I want you to think about, does your post... Does, your, does you, two years later, continuing to air this out there and continuing to, to bash this man, does that help the kingdom of God?
Does it help the way that the, that the non-Christians in this world view Christians? Does, does it help anything? Then he turned right around and posted another one talking about Lifeway because they have, they have here recently, they have put out a new set of ABCs. And they go from A to Z talking about social injustice. And they're, basically it is a step-by-step a -step way, the things that you look at, as a children's teacher on ways to address some of the things that's coming up. Rather than reading the whole article and seeing that it has some really good points in it, he automatically in his mind takes this and says, oh, they're replacing the ABCs of, ev of evangelism, and he gets on there and just slams Lifeway for it. It had nothing to do with that. But folks, here's the problem. All of his friends on Facebook are not Christians. And because of his negativity... And, and I see this all the time. I'm not just picking on this one person. But because of his negativity uh, toward other Christians and negativity toward, toward uh, ministries, other people who might possibly be considering, be looking at, being drawn, they're going to look at the way that we as Christians act toward other Christians. They're going to look at the way that we as Christians act toward other ministries and think... Why would I want to be a part of that? You know, if the children of Israel, look at this, through the, through the history of the children of Israel, when they went away from their morals and God had to punish them, nobody wanted to be a part of that. Nobody was drawn to Israel from those times. Folks, we as a church right now, if you compare us with Israel, those of us who are Christians, the Christians of the world, are like the Jews. Those foreigners, the Gentiles that he's talking about, are the lost folks outside of the church. Our job, our goal, our reason for being here as a church, our reason for being here as Christians is to tell other people. That's your goal. That is your number one job. Now, I know that as a Christian, I'm supposed to worship God, praise God, lift God up, all those things. Right? If that was the only reason that I was up here, if that was my main job, if that was my main goal, then the moment that I got saved, God would have plucked me from this earth and put me in his presence to where I could praise him personally to his face. But he chose to leave me here for a reason. He chose to leave all Christians here for a reason. And that reason is so that we can tell others. So that we can reach out to others. Folks, that is our mission as a church. That is our job, is to do missions, is to reach out, to let people know. If you live your life, a if you live a defeated life, and you walk around like, like you've got a chip on your shoulder, you walk around like, like you don't have anything to go for, you don't, people notice. People see it. Here in this prayer, Solomon brings out that they see your strong hand. They know your strength, God, because of the way you interact with your people. But yet we have people today who are not showing God's touch on their life. They're not allowing God's presence in their life to show forward. And folks, if we don't allow God's presence to shine within our lives, what hope do we have of reaching the world around us? Why would anybody be drawn to this temple if we as Christians don't live a victorious life? Folks, we are victorious. Whether we want, I mean, even though sometimes we look at the world around us, we've got to have the attitude even when things don't seem to be going my way, 
even when things are hard, even when the numbers may be down, even when coronavirus has got us all sheltered in. We've got to reach out. Right before, right before all this shut down and all this, we had just finished up our Who's Your One campaign. We had just finished the studies on Who's Your One. And, and then we, I challenged everybody to, to, to invite people to church, and then we had to shut the doors. But folks, we can't give up on that. We've got to continue. We've got to continue to be mission-minded when you think about missions, you've got to go back to, to Jesus told us to go, make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And because of that, we have to do missions. And we're going to talk about a lot of different missions in this world. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about, for the next few weeks, we're going to talk about a lot of different missions in Scripture. A lot of missionaries in Scripture. But if you're not living your life that pleases God, and, and you may not, listen, you may not be doing anything bad. I, I know people that are, they're not, they're not out there cussing and acting up and, and getting drunk. and They're not doing all those things. And therefore they think they're living right. And they think they're... they're uh, they're doing God's will. But they're walking around with a defeated attitude. Which is just as detrimental. Which is just as bad. Because it does not reach anybody for the Lord. Think about it. I mean, if you... Let's say you were going to a movie... Can't go to a movie right now, but let's say you wanted to go to a movie and the movie house, was, uh, the theater was open and you go and you're considering this one movie and, and you're getting ready to walk in and pay your about $40 now to go to a movie and, and you're getting ready to get your popcorn, you're standing in line and they, the, the movie just lets out and everybody that walked by is like, oh man, I feel awful after watching that movie. That didn't help me at all. That movie was bad. That movie was terrible. I just, I, I, I'm tarder. I'm, I'm feeling worse for watching it. I'm not going to spend my $40 to watch that movie. Folks, that's what people, people see Christians walking out the door. Just like we're defeated. Just like we're wore out. Just like we don't, we don't have anything to go for. We got to be upbeat. We got we to give people a reason. I've heard it said so many times in my life that we preach our sermon every day and sometimes we use words. Now I'm not going to go that far because Jesus even used words. So I know that we've got to use words. We've got to tell. But people aren't going to care about what you have to say if they see that you're not excited and they see that you're not happy, they see that you're not blessed because of God in your life. Folks, we've got to look at everything in our life as a blessing. Even the hardships, we've got to accept them as, as the will of God and be willing to live our life in a way that pleases God. Now, if you're here this morning and you've never given your life to God, you've never given your life to Christ, you've never, you've never knelt and said, Lord, I need you, I give it all to you, I ask for your forgiveness. If you've never done that in your life, then you've got no desire for missions. I know that. I understand that. You've got to have Christ in your life to, be, to feel that blessing from Him. In order to be able to show Christ in your life, you've got to have Him there. This morning, if you're here and you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior, then I'm going to invite you this morning to come. I'm going to invite you to come up and just give your life to God. But if you're here this morning, and maybe you gave your life to God a long time ago. Maybe you, maybe you, you gave your life to Jesus and you... you 
over the years, you've forgotten that joy. Maybe over the years, you've, you've allowed things in your life and you've allowed hardships in your life to get you down and you've never felt like you could just turn back around and say, God, I'm going to bless you no matter what. If that's you this morning, I'm going to ask you just come here in just a few minutes. Kneel before God and say, God, forgive me. Because if you're living your life defeated and you're not praising God and you're not lifting Him up to the people around you, you need to ask God for forgiveness. And you need to ask Him to get you back on track. Because folks, if we're failing to bring people in that door, we're failing as Christians and we're failing Christ. So this morning, as we stand... As you turn in your hymnal to hymn number 435...